Good evening. And welcome to the American Antiquarian Society. And our public program for this evening travels with George in search of Washington and his legacy with Nathaniel Philbrick. We are coming to you live from Antiquarian Hall in Worcester, Massachusetts. We have a wonderful audience right here. I welcome, welcome to everybody here in Antiquarian Hall. For many of you, I should say welcome back to Antiquarian Hall. I know many of you are, have been regulars here at our programs over the years, and others are newcomers tonight. And welcome to all of you. We also have an audience on YouTube watching this live streaming, and we want to welcome them as well. We are on the historic ancestral homelands of the Nipmuc tribal community, a community that remains very much a presence here in central Massachusetts. My name is Scott Casper, and I have the honor of serving as president of the American Antiquarian Society. Many of you know us, of course, but for those of you who don't, let me say a bit about the Antiquarian Society. Our mission is to cultivate a deeper understanding of the American past, grounded in the primary sources, print and manuscript material, in our ever-growing collections. We also aim to foster a broad community of inquiry, of people who are interested in the American past, uh, and we do that through support of research and through public programs like this one tonight. Our collections here in the American Antiquarian Society number some four and a half million objects in the graphic arts, in books and pamphlets, in newspapers and serials, in children's literature, uh, and in manuscripts. And I want to give a special shout out tonight to our newspaper collection, uh, which is the best newspaper collection, the deepest newspaper collections, a collection of pre-1900 American newspapers anywhere in the world. More than two and a half million issues of newspapers right here in, at the American Antiquarian Society. That becomes important because if you wanted to trace George Washington's journeys in the late 1700s, the newspapers would be a good place to trace him from town to town. The American Antiquarian Society welcomes and supports researchers, whether they are scholars or artists or people doing, simply doing research for their own desires. We welcome you to come and use our collections or to seek out our digitized materials through our website. Uh, we also offer regular programming like this, and I will be talking at the end of the program about some of what we've got coming up in the coming weeks. We thank you for joining us this evening. For those of us who are joining you virtually tonight, my colleague Amanda Kondek is monitoring the YouTube and she will be sharing a few notes about how to comment and ask questions through the YouTube chat function. Uh, after Nathaniel Philbrick and I have talked a bit, we're going to open this up to questions both from people here in our live, in our live audience right here in Antiquarian Hall and for people who are watching us on YouTube. Um, the other person I want to shout, give a shout out, especially to tonight is our media producer, Nate Fisk, who is running the controls in the back and making sure that this is working uh, both our mics up here and, and the f for the folks in the world of YouTube. So now to our speaker. Nathaniel Philbrick is well known to friends of the American Antiquarian Society because he has spoken here before about several of his previous books. He is the author of more than 15 books on many facets of American history, and most of them are prize winners. Uh, notably, Mayflower, A Story of Courage, Community and War, which was finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in History, Why Read Moby Dick, as if we had to ask, and Bunker Hill, A City, A Siege, A Revolution. The list of honors and awards for his books is remarkable. Go to his website and check that out. Most admirable, I think, is his commitment to writing history for broad audiences who are interested in the American past. 
what he does in his books really is, is bring us all into conversation with the past. And that is both a gift, um, it's, it's a gift as a writer and it's a gift to us all. His most recent book, Travels with George in Search of Washington and His Legacy, might be called the latest in Nat Philbrick's uh, story of George Washington, which also includes Valiant Ambition, George Washington, Benedict Arnold, and the Fate of the American Revolution, and In the Hurricane's Eye, The Genius of George Washington and the Victory at Yorktown. Nat Philbrick, welcome back to the American Antiquarian Society. Well, thank you, Scott. It's great to be here again. Yeah, we're, we're thrilled that you're with us. So, several years ago, you, your wife, Melissa, and your dog, Dora, yes. went off to trace George Washington's presidential journeys of 1789 to 1791. What possessed you to do it? <laughs> well, good question, Scott. Well, we, um, I had, was finishing my third book about the American Revolution. Uh, in the Hurricane's Eye, which is about the year of Yorktown and the naval battle uh, fought between the British and the French that made that victory possible. And I was doing some late inning research. I was in Providence, Rhode Island, and I made my way to the John Brown House. Now, this is John Brown, not the John Brown, the abolitionist. This is a very different John Brown. This is John Brown actually a slave trader, uh, one of the co-founders of Brown University. And um, in the back of his brick magisterial house is a, a little addition that includes what's known as John Brown's chariot. This is a horse-drawn carriage with one seat uh, about the size of the back seat of a VW bug. And uh, uh, according to family tradition, John Brown, who was a big man, uh, had a face like Mr. Bean, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the comic. Um, so a big guy. And the newly inaugurated President George Washington uh, went on a ride in John Brown's chariot to Fox Point, where Brown was building a new ship named for the new president. Now, you know, I knew uh, Washington as general had been to Providence many times, but I, w I didn't know about this visit as president. Why, why was he in Providence? What was going on here? And so that's when um, I started to look into the fact that you know, he went on these series of tours of, of America in an attempt to pull the country together. And I had, you know, was finishing the, this third book, it was, uh, 10 years in one topic, which is unusual for me. Usually I go from one topic to something completely different, but for the last 10 years, two years longer than it took to fight the darn revolution <laughs> war, um, I had been doing, it was just, had been an incredible experience, but you know, I just, I missed, I, I, I needed to get out of the office. I live on Nantucket, which is, 30 miles off the coast of Massachusetts. I w work in a tiny uh, basement office, uh, and I love Nantucket, but it's, it's isolated. I grew up in that nautical center of the universe, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, where I developed an improbable love of sailing, and to get anywhere, as if you're a sailor in Pittsburgh, you have to drive. And so I used to drive with my sunfish on the roof of the, the VW Bug to uh, a flooded strip mine that was known as Lake Arthur, where they raised sunfish, to races all over the country. I love the race sailing, but I love the travel. I love being on the road, the food, the maps, you know, all of that kind of thing. But on Nantucket, it's 14 miles long. Um, you know, it takes 25 minutes to get from one end of the island to the other. When I'd get a... Uh, a uh, audio version of one of my books, uh, I'd put in the CD and to listen to the first chapter, I'd do five laps. And uh, so I, I was pent up. I wanted to do something different. I wanted to get out on the road. And so the result was Travels with George. And what you're doing in this book is tracing a series of, of journeys that Washington made in the first couple years of his presidency. And when I think about Washington, what I, what I recognize is that 
unlike many of the other people we consider founding fathers who had spent their careers looking toward Europe. You know, so John Adams and Thomas Jefferson go as ambassadors, as ambassadors to England and France, Benjamin Franklin as well. Washington, by the time he's president, has already seen a vast swath of the North American continent, going back to the time he was a surveyor. So when he thinks about taking these trips as president, how's that different from all the travel he had been doing, whether it's back to his days as a surveyor and to the revolution as well, because he's, now he's the president. What's right. He, what's the well, the big difference is he's president. He's president. So, and, yeah. and as president, it's interesting, and this was a surprise to me. I didn't realize how being president um, was difficult for Washington on a personal and a physical level. I mean, as you said, this was a guy, all his life, he was on the road traveling. You know, uh, in the revolution, the climax was a 500-mile uh, march in summer from New York to, to, to uh, Yorktown. Even when he was at, uh, on Mount Vernon, he would routinely get up in the morning and be on horseback for six, w six hours inspecting the plantation, which was 5,000 acres. Um, so this guy was used to being out there moving. Uh, travel was just embedded in his personality. But when he becomes president, Suddenly, he's in an office <laughs> and under enormous stress. He is creating the office of the presidency. I mean, you know, this hadn't existed before. They're making it up as they go along. As Madison would say, we are in a wilderness, not knowing where we were going. And so he's, you know, he's tied to a desk under enormous stress. And within the first year, he almost dies twice twice of the various ailments. As he would write to Lafayette, you know, this, this job may very well kill me, uh, but I will keep doing this until I see it as far as I can take it. Um, and so, and one of the things Lafayette says is, hey, you owe it to yourself and your country to look out for your health. And the, one of the ways Washington began to realize was to get out of the office. And so going on these trips, was for him um, a way to see the American people, to um, communicate to them that, hey, we have a new government here, and I am not a king, I am not a dictator, I am, you know, I am not an emperor, I am one of you who happens to be president, so here I am coming to your town, your city, to talk about all of this. But he's also out there enjoying being on the road. And so for me, that was, you know, you, you get these anecdotes of people observing Washington, and he's not the guy staring at the $1 bill. Um, he's someone who's actually kind of enjoying himself, being out there, seeing the American people, exploring the country. And in the process, also helping to unite the country, which is, until very recently, 13 different colonies, and in fact, when he becomes president, two of those states have not even ratified the Constitution yet. He is the symbol of unity more than the government, more even than the office he holds. He, as a person, represents this whole country. Yeah, absolutely. A great point. I mean, you know, we think our generation invented a partisanship and division. <laughs> um, it goes way back. Um, you know, in the beginning, there were loyalists and patriots who were literally fighting it out. Um, and I think a lot of people don't appreciate how divisive the Constitution was. It was a very controversial document. Um, it divided the American people, not into political parties yet, but into those who were for the Constitution and the strong central government it created, known as Federalists. Uh, Washington was one, obviously, John Adams, Alexander Hamilton. And then there were those who were not sure this was the best thing for this country, who believed the states should retain the power that they had had under the original Articles of Confederation. Thomas Jefferson, a quintessential example of what was known as an anti-federalist. And so Washington realized, and as you said, two states had not ratified the Constitution. Uh, good old Rhode Island would be the last to come into the fold, you know, that independent man atop the uh, Capitol building. And, um, 
And so Washington really realized he needed to do something to pull the country together. And on top of all this, um, as you said, these had been 13 different colonies, states. Uh, when the governor of Virginia said, my country, he didn't mean the United States, he meant Virginia. Uh, and Washington needed to go out there. He couldn't get on the radio, couldn't get on TV and reach out to people through mass media. He had to go there from town to town. The New England tour, 60 towns alone in the New England tour, and tell, you know, and use his star power to help say this, you know, let's think of ourselves not as, you know, the resident of this town in this former colony, but part of the United States. And let's set the scene a little bit. George Washington is coming to town, the town of fill in the blank. What does it look like for George Washington, the president of the United States, to arrive in a town, to be celebrated in that town? How did it work? Yeah, I mean, well, for one thing, he did not have a security detail. Um, he did not have Air Force One. He was tra uh, traveling in a horse-drawn carriage, four horses. He had an entourage of about half a dozen people. Uh, you know, and uh, th they would stay. He had made the decision, uh, even before they departed, that he was not going to stay in the homes of his rich friends. He was going to stay in public taverns. Now, today, you know, there are plenty of historic houses where the sign is Washington slept here. You know, that's, my wife and I were so sick of that historical joke, you know. Uh, but, you know, the, he wasn't sleeping around. He was going, he was working tremendously hard to try to create a nation. And, uh, but so he stayed in these uh, public taverns, uh, which were the, the 18th century equivalent of roadside motels. Um, it's very good thing there was not TripAdvisor uh, back then, because in Washington's diary, he kept a diary, a uh, typical entry was food terrible, beds worse. Um, you know, it was, you know, this, he was, and two, hey, in two, uh, uh, two of these taverns in New England, uh, he was turned, his entourage was turned away uh, in Exbridge, uh, you know, sorry, we don't want you. They had to, you know, it's night, they have to find somewhere else. Um, but, you know, so he comes to your town, and um, the, 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 the carriage stops because Washington, after eight years, is commander-in-chief of uh, the Continental Army. This guy knows how to make an impression. He's 6'4", you know, which is really tall in the 18th century. As uh, Thomas Jefferson would, would say, he was the, horseman, the greatest horseman of the age, which in the 18th century, when everyone was on a horse, was saying something. So he would um, get out of his carriage dressed in his uh, Revolutionary War uniform, you know, with those gold epaulets on, on each shoulder, get on his great big white horse and ride down Main Street of, let's say, Shrewsbury, uh, with everyone going crazy. And, uh, you know, if you go to a political rally today, there's rock music and wide you know, huge screens and all that. You know, it's, it's, it all began with George Washington in his general's uniform riding down Main Street on a big white horse. And then, once he's in town, people are celebrating him and there are dinners with toasts and, and really just... Um, bringing him before both the masses and also the elites of the particular towns, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, it, in most towns, it developed into kind of a routine. Uh, you know, you might say one rubber chicken dinner after another, where uh, he would be presented uh, uh, with, with letters uh, of, of thanks from the various organizations, uh, the... The, the ministers of the town uh, from the Society of the Cincinnati. These are uh, Revolutionary War, officers of the Revolutionary War who had a fraternal society. These kinds of things, all saying versions of, we are so happy you're president and you have come to honor us with your presence. And then he would give a formal reply that would you know, be written and, and, and presented. And, and, it was, and then there would be, um, there was often a big dinner 
um, uh, where the militia, and often the militia would uh, uh, escort him in. He did not like the militia escorting him in because not only did this make it a little too of a militaristic, um, because hey, he had been a general. He had to walk, you know, be a little careful in all this. And, and actually when he was in Worcester, he did not wear his general uniform. He went with the brown suit that he had worn at his inauguration in New York at the temporary capital. And, you know, so he was very sensitive to all this kind of thing. But, um, but he hated it when the, uh, you know, the, the militia was on their horses bringing him in because it kicked up a lot of dust. And so often uh, what he would do is that, you know, after a dinner where there were all these toasts and, and you know, these were toasts, you know, before Twitter, there were toasts <laughs> where, you know, people would say in, what is it, 32 words or whatever. Something like that. Something yeah. like mm -hmm. that, you know, to, you know, the unity or something like, you know, but always with a little bit of a, a point and then, you know, and sometimes he would respond, but, you know, and then they'd shoot off cannons and all of that kind of stuff. And then that evening, he often would, uh, the militia would say, so what time are you leaving so we can escort you out of the city? And, and often he would say, oh, I'll uh, be leaving at 10 a.m. sharp. Okay, see you there. He would leave at 8 a.m and get out uh, without uh, the cloud of dust uh, choking him on his way out. Yeah. And in some of these places, I, I'm thinking of, of John Hancock here in Massachusetts, there was a little bit of a, a power tug of war between Washington and the governor who thought of himself as the, as the highest dignitary. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, you know, hey, before the Constitution, the most powerful political figures in the country were governors. The states were where all the power resided. I mean, that's because they had, they were the ones with taxation power. And uh, John Hancock was the most famous popular person in Massachusetts. You know, in the revolution, he had been, uh, you know, labeled King Hancock by the Patriots, you know, as sort of a, uh, yeah, and, but you know, things between Hancock and Washington were a little bit problematic. Uh, John Adams, who nominated Washington to be commander of the Continental Army, uh, remembered that when he placed his name in nomination, Hancock, who was the president of the Second Continental Congress, sort of flinched, looked a little angry that he hadn't been the one nominated. And during the Revolution, once Hancock was back as governor of, of um, Massachusetts, Washington would write him several letters pleading uh, for uh, uh, provisions for his army, for more recruits, none of which Hancock seems to have answered. And so, you know, there was something going on there. Washington is making his way across Massachusetts. He's in Worcester. And uh, by this time, he and Hancock are exchanging letters where Hancock is saying, please, you have to stay at my mansion on Beacon Hill, uh, where the state house is now, is where uh, Hancock was. Uh, you have to stay with me. And, and Washington says, no, I'm, you know, I've made a policy of staying in public taverns. I'm sorry, I can't. Hancock says, okay, well, will you at least come to dinner? And, and Washington says, sure, I would be honored to. So uh, Washington uh, reviews the militia that morning in Cambridge before heading into Boston. Uh, and Vice, uh, the, the, the Lieutenant Governor Samuel Adams is there, but not Governor Hancock. Washington takes note of this. Um, Washington uh, marches down the newly named Washington Street Know, into downtown Boston to the State House, which is now the old State House where they created a kind of George Washington Welcome Center um, uh, where uh, he will ultimately sit while he watches a parade go by of all the guilds in, in Boston with flags and, and all of this kind of thing. It's a huge crowd, more people than anyone had ever seen in Boston. And Washington goes back to his quarters He's due to have dinner with John Hancock, and he says, since you have not seen fit to welcome me, I will not be at coming to dinner. Hmm, 
message delivered. Hancock realized he may have miscalculated here. Yes, he might be the most popular man in Massachusetts, but George Washington is the most popular man in the world. And um, he writes Washington a, a, a quick letter saying, I have the gout. I, you know, I would have been there, but um, you're right. I really need to come check, you know, greet you. I will be risking death but I will do exactly that. So, very melodramatically, he has two servants carry him in to Washington's quarters, his, his, uh, his leg wrapped in red flannel, and he says, oh, you know, oh, it's so good to see you, you know, I'm, but if you would come to dinner, that would be great at some point. And Washington says, now, yes, I'd be happy to come to dinner. Message delivered. A president outranks a governor. We take that for granted now. That wasn't necessarily the case uh, at this time. And so I think we, you know, we now have a sense of the, the, the importance of the office of the presidency largely because George Washington refused a dinner inv invitation from John Hancock. And as, as you write about your journeys and Washington's journeys. A recurring theme throughout your narrative is the question of Washington as a slaveholder. So Washington, Washington's entourage, the people he's traveling with, include two of his enslaved men, Giles and Paris, I believe. Yep. And he's going through some areas in the Northeast that have abolished slavery by the time he goes through them. Then in 1791, he takes a, a trip through the South, which is a much more grueling trip than the one in, in New England. How does, how does slavery become a part of the story of, of his own travel? It's certainly part of what you're exploring in yours, but was the fact that he was bringing enslaved people remarked upon? Was he thinking about what he was encountering, whether it be abolitionists in the North or slaveholders in the South? Yeah, it's, I mean, for me, um, I had to talk about slavery in this book. Um, when we're talking about unity, division, when we're talking about the history of this country and Washington's position as our first president as a slave holder there at Mount Vernon. And, you know, that's a great question. You know, how much was the issue of slavery on people's mind at this time during Washington's tour? Not that much. I mean, what Washington was desperately trying to do was to create a sense of unity among white male uh, Americans. They were the ones who were um, enfranchised at this point, except for New Jersey. Women could vote in New Jersey at this time. They would lose that subsequently. But if you were a woman, or even an African-American landowner in New Jersey at this time, you could vote. Uh, but that was not the case throughout the rest of the country. But why, you know, the, in the con when they were at the Constitutional Convention, slavery, of course, was the issue that almost blew the convention. And so the, the compromise was, you know, what came out was in order to keep the South in on this, there were all sorts of, you know, they basically tabled the issue of slavery for the future and gave the South votes based on a population, <laughs> including the slaves they held. Um, and, um, you know, so this had all, the, and the hope was that, you know, eventually the institution would wither and die. That was not going to happen, as we, we know. But so Washington is not raising the issue of slavery at all uh, during uh, this tour. I raise the issue of slavery while Melissa and I follow Washington, Washington uh, through this, and we, it's an issue we talk about, with, talked about with various people we would meet as we made our way um, across the country in his footsteps. I mean, the one thing I think it's important to, to say about Washington in slavery was this is a guy who goes into the Revolutionary War pretty much your standard plantation owner you know, from Virginia. He's got 100 African-American enslaved people at Mount Vernon. Half of them are his, half of them are owned by the estate of Martha's deceased husband and willed to their grand, her grandchildren. But um, the, the revolution changes him. 
you know, they, his African-American soldiers demonstrate that African-Americans are as brave and capable as anyone in his army. His relationship with Lafayette, that young French nobleman who's an abolitionist, really begins, you know, this is someone who after the revolution would say, if I had known I was helping to create a nation of slavery, I never would have raised my sword in the um, cause of American slavery. Uh, that's Lafayette. Um, Washington comes to realize how dangerous slavery is, will be to the future unity of America. And actually, Jefferson would record an overheard conversation in the cabinet meeting in which Washington, and he was a Southerner, but he was a Southerner with basically the political agenda of a Northerner being a Federalist. You know, he was unusual in that regard. But uh, he was overheard to say, if slavery should ever divide this country, I will go with the northern part, which is a remarkable statement from a Virginian. Um, yes, he would free his enslaved wor workers upon his death, but only upon his death, actually after his death. You know, he did not live up to, you know, the, the, the standard we now would w perhaps hold to him. But ultimately, I think he was someone who aspired to be better than he was, as I think all of us do. We are all paradoxes. We, you know, we all say we want to be something, but never quite measure up. And this Washington was no different from that, but he was our first president, and therefore the, the microscope is on him. And I just ultimately hope that uh, with this book, the reader gets some sense of how Washington traveled, not only in the miles, but as a human being. Um, uh, not only as general of the Continental Army, but, but as president of the United States. And, and your book, which put me in mind of the work of Tony Harwitz, another author I admire greatly. You know, Harwitz, like you, traveled around in, in Confederates in the Attic, travels around the United States searching for the ways in which the Civil War still resonated in the South. And a lot of that book, a lot of that book, and I think in many ways your book is about, is not just about Washington and his time, but about us in our day today. I mean, what, as you traveled the United States and you talked with people about Washington's legacy in their places, what did you come away with about today's United States? We think of, of the United States today as being so divided in many ways, as you say, it was so divided in Washington's day. What, what was the sense that you got as you traveled around? Yeah, it was interesting. Um, one of the things I wanted with this book is, yes, we are a divided country. I think we all know that. Um, what I was interested in is what Washington tried to do to unite us. And, you know, what possible historical perspective that could ap apply to our divided times. And, and you know, I was expect going into this, I was sort of expecting going into each town, seeing these divisions, making, you know, this red hot issue that would, and what I was seeing, and one of the things I did even before we headed out was reach out to the historical societies and libraries of, of as many of the towns Washington visited as possible. I mean, we're, that's a, it was, it, you know, I thought, that I originally thought this book, oh, this will be a little less research than most of my books. No, no, this, this was a huge task. And it brought, and soon I was getting all of this stuff about Washington's visit to their town. And, and so, and so that when it came to visiting these towns, I already had contacts, and in many cases, the local historian or librarian would take, drive us around, and you know, showing us places. And what the message we were getting was not Washington is a divisive figure, but how proud they were that Washington had come to the town, and how how distinctly he was remembered. I mean, you get accounts of. A Sarah, eight-year-old girl, at the gate of her house, looking out at them, watching, watching them building a one-room schoolhouse across the street, when suddenly a large man on a white horse uh, comes by in front of her. It's George Washington, who sees, <laughs> sees these guys building a house, um, tells his entourage to give them three cheers, and gets off his horse. They're about to put a rafter in the roof and helps them put the rafter in the roof. Hey, he was a tall guy. And, um, and tips them a dollar. And Sarah, went 88 years later, when she is 93, um, 
is living in Greenwich Village, talks to a reporter, and tells the story of seeing Washington. And, you know, this kind of local history is not, you know, living in a, uh, a, 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 you know, a book on a musty shelf. It's an actual part of these towns, of what's being told to their to people, to children. I mean, it's active. You know, uh, Tip O'Neill um, said all politics is local. I'm here before you today to say all history is local. And so this is one of the things I'm so grateful to Washington um, for providing us with the excuse to follow him was to, to see that. And so it was, it was an experience by which I had a very affirmative, uh, affirming sense of the power of the past to inspire people about where they are now. And, you know, it was not, I wasn't getting this sort of toxic thing where, you know, he was a lightning rod to various sides. It was more, hey, he was there at the beginning trying to pull us together. Um, and so that's, I mean, that was our experience as we made our way through. And one of the things that, that I enjoyed reading as I, was, as I was going through the book was the ways in which these local towns have histories that in some cases combine traceable history with uh, what you might say is, is fables. Yes. Um, you know, <laughs> George Washington's supposed dog named Cornwallis, for example. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Cornwallis. Oh, I wanted to believe in Cornwallis so bad. Here we... Okay. Char travels with Charlie Steinbeck's book about uh, driving the, the country with his 10-year-old uh, standard poodle, Charlie. It's one of my favorite books of all time. And so it was a shameless... Uh, uh, plagiarism on my part to say we're going to bring our dog Dora. Uh, she's actually in the car right now. She's a uh, now a five-year-old um, Nova Scotia duck tolling retriever, but she was um, just a little thing back then. And um, you know, and so you know, this was. I wanted to believe that Washington, the, 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 the tradition is during his southern tour, which took three months. I mean three months. Uh, he went all the way down to Savannah and then headed inland to Augusta before making his way back. And according to tradition, and believe me, a lot of, um, you know, uh, uh, very respected historians have written biographies and accounts of Washington stating Cornwallis's presence as fact. And so I desperately wanted to believe in this. You know, I had a dog, Washington had a dog. This is great. And according to these, Washington had made his way uh, to uh, Augusta. And by this time, you know, they were well, month and a half into a very grueling tour. And finally, the pace of this, this tour caught up to Cornwallis, and he expired, died. And according to the accounts that were left, Washington was moved to tears as he buried his, uh, his dog. And ultimately, the, the, uh, Cornwallis's body would be encrypted in a uh, brick tomb, which would be discovered when uh, they were doing uh, road work in Savannah in the late 19th century. And, okay, so I thought this is great. And so we, uh, M Melissa and I and Dora, go to uh, Augusta. Uh, there I had been in contact uh, with a, a reporter at, this, at the, this, the Augusta Chronicle who had give it, been really helpful, and he's a real, he, you know, he has a, has a history column in the paper, and he gave us a tour, and is driving around, and I was talking to him enthusiastically about Cornwallis, you know, you know, hey, name for a British general that Washington had defeated at Yorktown, this is just terrific. He said, Nat, did you look at the date, because uh, the article about um, where all of this comes from is an article in the Augusta Chronicle. And he said, Nat, did you look at the date of that article? And I said, no, why? He said, well, it was April 1st. <laughs> he said, we have, no one has ever, where they were doing road work was nowhere near 
where George Washington was when he came to Augusta. Uh, we have never found anything resembling that. It was an April Fool's joke. I go, oh, man, say it ain't so. And, and by the way, um, you know, Parson Weems, uh, the, the, the minister who wrote the, 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 uh, the very popular uh, biography of Washington, it went through multiple editions. And the edition in which Weems added the bit about Washington chopping down his father's cherry tree was while he was a minister in Augusta. So it seems like Augusta is a font of misinformation when it comes to George Washington. I would like to uh, invite anybody either in our audience here in Antiquarian Hall or on the web uh, version on the, on the YouTube to join in asking questions and, and learning more from Nat Philbrick. Um, if you would like to ask a question, uh, we have a mic set up in the back of the room over here. If, uh, if it is hard for you to get to that mic, I'm happy to bring my mic out to you. Uh, and Amanda will be monitoring questions on the YouTube. So, um, the floor is open if folks would like to, to go to the mic and ask a question. I think I see, I see Jim Moran going to the mic. Hi, Jim. Well, thank you, Jim. Good to see you. Nice to see you, too. Um, uh, I'm curious, in all your, both the three-volume history of uh, the, the revolution and in this book, what is it that surprised you the most about Washington? Yeah. I mean, what surprised me about Washington, I have to say, uh, you know, he rightfully has a reputation as someone not a backslapper, not a hugger. Um, someone who purposely maintained a remoteness to people because that's what he felt great leaders do. You cannot become too close um, to, to even, you know, the people, Lafayette being an exception. Um, and, um, you know, so he, he has that reputation. But what was surprised me was this is Washington, not the president, not the general, uh, this is Washington on the road, you know, and um, it was, what surprised me was, you know, just the, the, the kinds of things he would say and, and the, the ease with which he would communicate with people. And for it just, it just one example, um, which uh, he, he was on, on the Southern tour, and believe me, this was grueling. Uh, and there were a lot of places where, they, you know, they didn't even have taverns. And so uh, he would, ha you know, he had, he got breakfast at one place thinking it was a tavern and it was just somebody's house. And so when he comes to pay for them, they say, no, sorry, we, you know, we did this, you know, this, and he goes, oh man, you know, uh, it was, it was, it was tough traveling. And so he's just been to Georgetown, uh, South Carolina, crosses the river there, actually a couple of rivers, and is on his way to Charleston when he stops at Hampton Plantation, uh, which is this beautiful uh, plantation that is now part of the state, is owned by the state of South Carolina. Um, but before it had uh, become owned by the state, had been in the same family it's right up until the 1970s. I mean, it's just beautiful. And the widow who owned it at the time Washington visited had um, just built a new porch to the um, structure that changed the orientation of the house from the river behind it, what that had been behind it, to the road on the other side. And she had fin it had been finished just before Washington arrived. She insisted that no one but Washington could be the first person to walk up the steps. And so um, Washington arrives, uh, one of her relatives would write a note saying he is the biggest man I have ever seen, has incredibly large hands. Um, and he makes his way, you know, the 6'4 guy wakes his way up the, the steps and she greets him and says, you know, thank you, you know, we've just built this. As you can see, there, there's this live, huge live oak right in front of the porch, and she said, "As you, you know, we're going to have to cut that down because it's right in front of the porch." And Washington, you know, the supposed slayer of his uh, father's cherry tree, says, "No, don't do that. 
you know, man can never replace a tree like that, keep it. If you go to Hampton Plantation, and if you're ever in the area, I really recommend it. It's just a fantastic historic structure with an incredible story to tell. If you go there now, there is that live oak. It's still there. It is a monster. You know, Spanish moss dripping from it. And for me, you know, the, yes, there is wa the Washington Monument in, in Washington, D.C. That's the Washington Monument right there. You know, a living memorial to, the, to something, that Washington on the road, you know, subtly, directly um, interacting with people, trying to create something that will t hold together long after he go he's gone. very much. Uh, your, your books are outstanding. Uh, two questions, if I may. The scene at the inauguration where it appeared that he almost fainted into a chair. I, I would wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Also, the incident with John Hancock in the book you mentioned that as several British officers learned, it was best not to mess with George Washington. I would wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that. And one last question. Uh, Patriots or Steelers? <laughs> okay. This is a fellow Pittsburgher, I think. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Go Steelers. Well, I'm torn between the... Uh, first off, um, my mother was a huge Steelers fan, and she has gifted her terrible towel to my granddaughter, uh, Lydia. And so, uh, and Lydia's father is a Cincinnati Bengal fan, The you know, consummate rival of the, so it's a very conflicted household. Um, but um, but the, 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 the first question was the inauguration. Yes, and you put your figure on one of the scenes that really um, struck me. You know, we think of Washington as the man completely in control. And, you know, and I think a lot of historians sort of treat him a, and blame him because since he's in control, why didn't he do this? The fact is, he wasn't in control of this situation. This is all new. No one knew where it was headed. How was he going to create a government that was going to tax a people that had rebelled against the most powerful military force on the planet? over the issue of taxation. You know, he didn't know where it was going. He feared, he really did not want to be president. He feared that all of uh, the, the, the um, honors that had been heaped upon him as a consequence of his role as general would be thrown away after he had attempted to become president. He thought, saw it as a thankless task in which he would very probably you know, ruin the legacy he had worked so hard to create during the eight years of, of the revolution. And so when he was inaugurated, you know, and it's this huge party in New York, they'd never seen anything like it. You know, the streets were so crowded with people when he arrived by boat uh, that you couldn't get a carriage down it. He had to walk up with a, you know, some militia trying to push people aside. You know, he ends up in this, this house that they, has become what will be the White House in, in, um, in New York. And he almost immediately you know, gets so sick he dies. But before that, he has to be inaugurated president. And he had already, uh, even before the election, where it would look like, you know, there was no one else who could do this, to be president and have any hope of uniting the country. When he, he had one of his, he worked with one of his personal secretaries about uh, a draft of a potential inauguration speech that ended up being 73 pages long in which he goes over and over about why he doesn't want to do this, why, you know, how people are going to think he's doing this to enrich himself, how people are, you know, you know, it's all of his worst fears and doubts. Finally, James Madison, who he sends a copy of it to, says, well, no, don't do this. You know, make it two pages and get out of there. So this is the kind of feeling Washington is bringing to the inauguration. As I said earlier, he's not in his uh, general's outfit. He's in a brown suit manufactured in Hartford, 
a domestic manufacturer, and there really weren't many cloth textile mills uh, in America at this point. And um, it's, it's, in, uh, it's at Federal Hall. Uh, there's still now a Federal Hall. It's not the same building, but it's on the same foundation. And uh, the inauguration will be perfor is performed on the second story balcony. And huge crowds surrounding the city. Uh, and there is a, a girl named Eliza who was 15 at the time, who is on the roof of the house directly across the street watching. She has a bird's eye view. And she's watching as, you know, the, 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 the dignitaries assemble on the porch and, and Washington come, you know, stands up and he looks around and he's overcome. He, he's not... He's not, you know, like proud or whatever. He's overcome and he collapses into a chair. Silence. It's, you know, they're just watching him. What's going to happen here? And finally, he pulls himself together, stands up, and goes forward and takes the oath of office. You know, this was not Washington proud, the culmination of all my ambitions. This was Washington forced in a situation he never wanted to be in, fearful that he was not going to be up to the task, that no one was going to be up to the task, doing his best. And so I think it's really important that this human side of Washington be appreciated. I think there are many historians operating today who refuse to see that aspect of his personality, that he was a human being very conscious of his flaws, overawed by the responsibility, and doing the best he could. I think we have a question from our YouTube audience. Amanda? Thank you, Scott. So Brooke Olivia asks, did Washington visit all 13 colonies? The question, yes. Washington did visit all 13 colonies. If you count his, his inaugural tour, from a pre-inaugural tour from Mount Vernon to New York. He visited all 13 of them, and um, he was even at one point when he made his way up to uh, Portsmouth. He, uh, Maine was at that point part of Massachusetts, but during a harbor tour in Portsmouth by boat, he would pull into a stone dock that still exists on Kittery Point and uh, uh, meet with the minister at the congregational church there, thus meaning he also went to Maine. Uh, he had hopes of making his way to Vermont, which was next in the queue to become a state. But heavy snows and business back in New York meant that he had to, to get back. And so, I mean, this is um, a huge undertaking uh, for him. You know, that, that uh, he, he covered close to 3,000 miles when you put all of what he was doing uh, together. It was, it was um, a tough physical undertaking, but for something, and you know, during the Southern tour, he was on the road by 4 a.m. You know, it was hot. Uh, these were horrible roads. Often it would, it would be sundown before he was you know, pulling into the next tavern. And so uh, this was a grueling ordeal uh, for a lot of it, but something Washington felt he needed to do, something that a deep part of him actually enjoyed. And, um, and so he, you know, he, this was a whistle-top stop tour before there was uh, a railroad. Uh, oh. uh, hang on. So how did he find his, his way around? I mean, he didn't have AAA, he didn't have GPS. How did he know how to find all these towns and make his way around the country? Yeah, yeah, uh, you know, how did he do it? Well, one of the things uh, which was, you know, because this book is about Washington, but it's also about Melissa and I following him. And, and there's also some memoir from my point thrown in. And one of the things Melissa would do, we'd be following Washington. For example, when we followed Washington from Mount Vernon to New York, uh, there, you know, the question is, where was the old road given where we are now? And in that instance, we were really lucky. When Washington marched from New York to Yorktown, uh, 
with Rochambeau, the French general, Rochambeau's uh, surveyors uh, drew very detailed maps of the route down there. That has been put online, and the Rochambeau Society has created uh, Google-powered maps of where those roads are on today's roads, which is really cool. So being a slave, you know, I said, Melissa, we are going to follow where Washington went. So here we are on this Miracle Mile in Maryland, and Melissa turns on, you know, and she's saying, what does this do to help you? You know, you're, you're, you know, how will this translate in, you know, reaching a cosmic understanding of Washington? And so she turned on the Google Maps function that kept telling us, because we were going to Baltimore, kept telling us to get on the highway. And uh, I like to think Washington, who wanted to get the trip from Mount Vernon to New York over as fast as possible and get this whole inauguration thing over with, that was the disembodied voice of Washington, telling us to get off <laughs> this miracle mile and haul butt to uh, New York. But anyways, how did Washington do it? Well, one of the things is, for example, his, his New England tour was fairly scripted go on his way up to Portsmouth. You know, they really sort of knew where they were going. Towns were prepared. You know, there was a, uh, you know, it was pretty much one place after another. Going back, however, it was not that case. And so he was coming back from Portsmouth, New Hampshire to New York, and he was trying to go as fast as he could. There's no front man warming up the crowds or letting, no one knew. And so he would show up in a town like uh, Milford, Mass, and uh, the local minister and his son were uh, hauling out the manure from the back of their house when someone says, hey, is that George Washington going by on that carriage? And he stopped at the tavern. And they said, Mike, it's George Washington. And so the minister would, uh, would, would uh, go home, do a quick shave, and um, uh, his son would never forgive him for not taking him with him to the tavern to see George Washington. And so George was making this way. Well, at one point in his diary, he complains about how bad, how confusing the roads are from uh, Boston south that they, and he said, we'd stop and people would give us completely confused directions. These roads are crooked, you know, they get lost and, and confused. You know, this would happen there, would happen in the South. Um, you know, one of the things I think was the result of uh, Washington's tour was it created a real sense of shame throughout the country when it came to the state of the roads and the accommodations. And, you know, it's been said that Washington's tour of America inspired the American hotel industry. Um, because sure enough, right after it, you get the first hotels in New York and throughout the country beginning to spring up and the roads get better. You know, this was going to happen anyways. But one thing Washington was doing was shining a spotlight on how bad our country's infrastructure was. He would have loved President Eisenhower's interstate highway system. Oh, yes, he would have, absolutely. He, I mean, that is exactly the kind of, of, of the, he was all about transportation, you know, and uh, uh, one of the, it's not just roads, but for him, then, you know, it was rivers were such a huge part. Of, that's one of the reasons why he felt the nation's capital should be in wa where Washington, D.C. is now, because he saw the Potomac as what the Erie Canal would eventually become as the artery, the water artery that would carry goods from the west east. And um, yeah, so he was all about transportation. And yeah, he and Eisenhower, I think, would have had a lot in common. In a lot of ways, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll go to the mic here, and then we'll go back to Amanda. Yeah, please. I really enjoyed Mayflower and In the Heart of the Sea. So thank you very much for those. Regarding the travels, I wonder if he visited any of his battlefield sites, Long Island, Washington Heights, Princeton, Valley Forge. Yeah, yeah. Well, when it came, you know, he was a general. And one of his more interesting uh, uh, tours uh, was of Western Long Island, just four days. And it's the only presidential tour that he took during those two years of office where there's absolutely no newspaper coverage, a total media blackout. 
And you might ask, why was he touring Western uh, New York? Well, during the revolution, uh, he developed a spy network known as the Culper Spy Ring. If you've seen the series Turn, you might uh, be aware of it. That's based on um, uh, a, 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 a book about, called Washington Spies. That's just terrific. And, um, and so what Washington seems to have done what, because the, the Culper Spy Ring, the, the, the center of it was in Setauket, New York, which is on the north shore of Long Island, almost smack dab in the island. Uh, what, what, there was a loyalist from the neighboring town, uh, someone masquerading as a loyalist from the neighboring town of Oyster Bay, who was in New York. Uh, now remember, the British occupied New York City and all of Long Island. So this was occupied territory. The loyalist in, uh, with the last name of Townsend uh, would write up in invisible ink or in code uh, information that a, a, a tavern keeper in Setauket who was in New York to get provisions for his tavern, he'd pick up the, the, the message he would put it in a secret place in Setauket, which is right on the water, and at night, a whaleboat would sail over from Fairfield, Connecticut, across the Sound, pick up the message, take it back to Washington, who was on the Hudson, dug in, countering the British in New York. And so this was the call perspiring. Well, as president, Washington goes on this secret tour, unannounced, going to town after town associated with the Culper Spy Ring. None of the spies in the Culper Spy Ring, their identities were not even known to their own families. Uh, they would die unknown to anyone but Washington and his spy chief. It wouldn't be until the 20th century that a, a historian would un, you know, reveal the names of the, the people in the Culper spy ring. What was Washington doing? We don't know. Was he like giving them the secret handshake and thanking them? Was he paying them in some way? Or perhaps it was just his mere presence uh, that was kind of the, th you know, the, the, the wink and the nod that must have been incredibly uh, meaningful to these people who had risked their lives. Because the fear was, if the British should come back and, and this, this experiment as a republic should fail, you didn't want it known that you had been, a, you know, a British a spy. And so, uh, you know, that was an, an instance in where Washington was revisiting not a battlefield, but an, an aspect of the, um, the war that had been very important to ultimate victory. It was, he, he, it was during the Southern Tour uh, where he uh, made a real point of visiting a lot of battlefields because in the last years of the Revolution, the most important battles were all fought in the South as, as uh, that New Englander, the, the, you know, the, the fighting Quaker, Nathaniel Green, you know, countered Lord Cornwallis to the big showdown at, at a Guilford Courthouse in New York where the British technically win, but they're delivered such a blow that Cornwallis ultimately staggers into to Virginia and ends up at Yorktown. You know, you could argue that it was Nathaniel Green who really put that all into place. But so Washington hadn't seen these battles and battlefields. And so while he's on his tour, in his diary, he records visiting these, these battlefields. And in the case of uh, uh, the Guilford Courthouse, he even second guesses uh, Green's uh, tactics, uh, you know, being the former general. And so it was a chance for him to, um, to, to, to in this case, not revisit. Because, hey, we think of Washington as a Southerner. Yes, he was. But he actually knew the Mid-Atlantic and New England much better than he knew the South south of Virginia. He had never really been in North Carolina, never been to South Carolina, Georgia. This was new territory for him. This is terra incognita. And so, uh, uh, you know, he, this was, the Southern tour was really where he was breaking new ground in terms of his understanding of the country. Amanda? Okay. John Cass asks, in doing your research, you reached out to local towns. 
Did the process of connecting with all the local towns where Washington traveled give you a different perspective on the depths of history and research local historians have and can provide to other historians? Plus, do you think to some extent local historians are unsung? And so, how could we give more encouragement to local historians for the work they do? Well, great question. I mean, this, my book is really a love song uh, to local historians and librarians. Um, you know, these are the people, uh, for, for my money, uh, that really are keeping history alive. Uh, you know, without them, history would not be the vibrant, on-the-ground presence that it rightfully is. And, um, you know, when it came to, I mean, there is one, one thing where, you know, I, 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 you know, we would run into so, you know, we would meet so many of the people I had talked to one way or another. You know, it's one thing to email with some, then to drive around in a car with them. It's something else. And there was one librarian at the, um, the history room of, of the, um, what what town in uh, South Carolina, North Carolina? It was oh man. Anyways, we make our way up there, and there he is. And he like he's as I say in the book, uh, it's the same same dress code. Uh, J C Penny meets L L Bean. You know, it's you know the the the, the people who are in the ar the archives. You know, trying to to bring out the past in a way that is, is immediate to people. And so, I, and I think the, the, the questioner is right. I don't think local his, history gets the cred it should. Um, because, you know, we are a, na a nation, a huge nation, but ultimately it, the nation only works as well as each individual community um, uh, remembers its role in the past and its role as part of that nation. And so, um, uh, you know, for me, I began, I am not a historian by training. I was an English major in college. I, uh, I, my favorite novel was Moby Dick. We moved to the port of the Pequod, Nantucket, and I became interested in the history of Nantucket. And so what did I do? I, I taught myself how to be a historian. I, I hung out at the town building uh, with the documents there. I went to the Nantucket Historical Association, basically lived there for three years. The same thing with our local library, the Athenaeum, that has its own uh, special collection. That made possible my first work of history, A Way Offshore, A History of Nantucket, but it was also where I uh, began, in effect, researching what would become In the Heart of the Sea, about the, uh, the tragedy of the whale ship Essex. And so for me, local history is literally where it began. And so with this book, I really wanted uh, the reader to understand how important local historians are. And many of the, these historians are, are unpaid volunteers, and they're the ones keeping the, the flame alive. Thank you. We'll do one more question from down here. You have spoken eloquently about his leadership. Um, wondering if he read Machiavelli or some of the ancient writers such as Cicero, did that, did, were those people that he considered as he developed his role? Also, I would like to mention that my daughter just made a movie about Moby Dick. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> oh, good, I have to check it out, okay. Um, yes, uh, well, you must be a proud parent. Okay. Well, well listen, um, you know, uh, uh, when it comes to leadership, I mean, all, one way all my books are about leadership, um, whether it was Captain Pollard or first mate Owen Chase on the Essex, uh, Governor Bradford of, of, at, at Plymouth Colony, Custer at the Battle of Little Bighorn, that's leadership, Sitting Bull, uh, part of the Lakota Sioux, uh, and then Washington uh, when it came to the revolution, although in Bunker Hill, I think it's the unsung uh, leader of the on-the-ground revolution, uh, Dr. Joseph Warren. Uh, that was really w why I wrote that book. And Washington sort of makes a cameo later on that led me to 
the, the next two books. And, you know, Washington, uh, like all of the revolutionaries, really, were very into the classical uh, sources. Um, Washington, however, unlike John Adams and, and uh, Jefferson and Hamilton, you know, did not have a university education. Uh, you know, he, uh, he was basically self-taught, uh, but, uh, you know, he had, he had, he had, you know, read his, his Addison, uh, versions of the classical plays, uh, and when it came to leadership, I think most of it, uh, was, was learned on the battlefields. Uh, you know, he had, uh, remember he, he, uh, he fought in the the, the uh, Seven Years' War, otherwise known as the French and Indian War, where things did not go very well for him on the battlefield. I mean, everything he was pretty much associated with was a military failure. But as anyone knows, it's failures where you learn. And um, and and in the Revolution, he would suffer. Uh, Defeat after defeat, uh, you know, he would lose New York at the uh, Battle of of Long Island. Uh, you know, he would be forced across New Jersey uh, to the other side of the Del Delaware, only to mount the greatest comeback of all time to then suffer a series of defeats around Pennsylvania as the British made their way into Philadelphia. And so Washington uh, learned these kinds of things. I think, you know, if where there was a document that served as a kind of manual for him. It was the, you know, the, the, the civilities, the, you know, that, that famous things where he read as a teenager that, you know, lessons in how to be a gentleman. And, and I think those, because Washington had issues when it came to leadership, and one of them was his anger issues. <coughs> uh, he was a hothead, and he realized that. And, and there were people who complained about that frequently early on in his career. And so he did everything he could. He, you know, today we try to actualize who we really are, you know, and, and find our inner core of who we are. Washington, for Washington, no. <laughs> his whole energies were trying to say, no, I need to, for me to be more effective, I need to change my behavior. I need to control my uh, anger. You know, that's what, and every now and then it, it would erupt, and that from all accounts, it was this, a terrifying thing to see Washington angry. And, you know, he didn't, he wasn't able to necessarily change he, who he was. He was working on changing his behavior. You know, he was, this was someone who could learn and was trying to change, to adapt himself to be more effective. So many leaders are, I mean, so all, most of us, we're who we are at birth, and we spend our lives angry at the world for our failures when we could, if you looked in the mirror and said, well, maybe some of those failures you were responsible for yourself, Washington was not afraid to look into that mirror. And I think it made him such a very effective leader. And so Washington, for me, was a fascinating um, case of leadership, of learning on the job, and um, um, and and trying to 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 adapt yourself to be the most effective leader you could possibly be. And on that note, please join me in thanking Nathaniel Philbrick for this conversation. Thank you, and thank you, Scott. It was really great to be in conversation with you. A lot of fun. I would like to say thank you to all of you for coming and tell you a little bit about some of our upcoming programs because we never slow down here at the American Antiquarian Society. Um, we have a number of programs coming up in the next few weeks. Next week on Wednesday afternoon from 5.30 to 7 o'clock, we have a program called Chat with a Curator celebrating Worcester's 300th anniversary. That's a drop-in opportunity for anybody who would like to come and look at some of our collection objects uh, with our curator 
curators to be there and, and provide context. We're going to have objects ra ranging from 19th century letters and diaries to children's games, valentines, of course, here in Worcester, newspapers, photographs, items from the Brown family collection, and much more. That's next Wednesday from 5.30 to 7. On October 11th at 7 p.m., we will have another of these hybrid programs, both here in Antiquarian Hall and on YouTube, when Gregory Nobles will be here to talk about his new book, The Education of Betsy Stockton, An, o An Odyssey of Slavery and Freedom. And then on Thursday, October 20th, Jacqueline Jones will be here to deliver the Robert C. Barron Lecture, which will be a retrospective on her book, Labor of Love, Labor of Sorrow, Black Women, Work, and the Family, From Slavery to the Present, a book that won the Bancroft Prize in the late, in the mid-1980s. Both of those programs by Greg Nobles and Jackie Jones will be both live, streamed, and live here in Antiquarian Hall. Please check these out on our website. If you are here with us tonight, our friends from Tidepool Books here in Worcester, our independent bookseller here in Worcester, are here with copies of Nat Philbrick's book, which he would be happy to sign, I believe. Um, so please feel free to come and get a book. And to everybody in our audience here in Antiquarian Hall and on YouTube, thank you so much for joining us here. We look forward to seeing you again. Have a good evening.